The scripture for today's sermon is found on page 1764 in your pew Bibles. I invite you to turn with me to that passage and to hold it open so you can follow along during the sermon after we read it together. Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 14. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, for such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the adults need to share the cookies also uh, after worship, so I'd remind you not to be greedy, okay? Hopefully there's plenty for everyone. One of my favorite uh, Van Morrison songs is called The Bright Side of the Road. Some lyrics? Yeah, there we go. From the dark and lonely street. Anybody know this song? All right, good. Some Van Morrison fans. I'll have to get together and have a van night. To the bright side of the road will be lovers once again on the bright side of the road. And what Van does is contrast walking on the dark end of the street, which is symbolic of a, of a lonely um, and destructive place, to walking on the bright side of the road, a place where two people in love walk hand in hand in the clear light of day. Today's passage from Ephesians contrasts walking in darkness with walking in light. And Paul's encouragement to walk in the light is the fourth in a series of five walking instructions in Ephesians. And so you can see what we've done here. If you read your NIV Bible, it's good to use the word in parentheses, live a life or live. But actually what Paul wrote is walk. And, and walking, it's really helpful, I think, to think about this as Christian uh, walking is this metaphor for living. And so your life isn't just something static. Your life is something that's on the move. It's, it's who you are. It's, it's where you go. And, and in Ephesians 4 and 5, there are these walking instructions. And so thus far in our sermon series, we've learned to, in chapter 4, verse 1, walk in a way that is worthy of our calling. Chapter 4, verse 17, to not walk against God's purposes as we did in our pre-Christian or, or Gentile days. And just last week, to walk in self-giving love as Jesus loves us by giving up himself for us, verse 2. And, and so now we come to a new walking instruction. And I think because it's the uh, fourth in a series, we can say that this is really the core of this whole section of text. You know, there's a lot of other stuff in there, and I'm going to touch on most of it. I'm not going to have time for all of it, but I want to focus on this walking instruction because uh, it's the fourth in a series, and it's obviously, I think, the center of what Paul's trying to say. The Word says in Ephesians 5.8 that we are to walk in light because we are light. 
A couple weeks back, I talked about our, our identity as Christians is different than our pre-Christian identity. And so Paul says, walk in that which you are in Christ. Walk in light because you are light. Light is who we are, and so it's in the light where we belong. Later on in the passage, we read that God's light exposes everything. And for us, that shouldn't be a problem because we should have nothing to hide. I love it when I meet a person, and, and you can tell when you meet these people, and, and I've met a couple recently, who, man, they're just upfront, honest with you. They're not trying to hide anything. They're not guarded. They're just, yes, they're right there. And that's uh, exemplary of, of what the Christian life is supposed to be. We live in the light. We, we're willing to talk. We're willing to share, to be open, to upfront, not to hide, not to be guarded. Um, and just to, let the, to live in the light, to live in, in the plainness of day, we've got nothing to hide. We are no longer in darkness, so therefore, Paul says, we must no longer live in darkness. The purpose of our life together, our worship together, our Christian mission, could be summed up in the word light, as a reflection of God's light. It's, it's, our purpose is to reflect God and to display to, to others the marvelous light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. We are mirrors of God's brightness, of God's glory, of God's truth, of God's life. Walking in darkness as opposed to walking in light is a contrast that is sprinkled throughout the Bible. A couple of examples on the screen, Isaiah 9-2 and John 8-2. Going back to the Old Testament, God created Israel to be his people gave them the light of his presence, and commissioned them to be faithful to him, to act justly and ethically. By walking in the light, they would fulfill their identity as God's light to the nations. And, and, and God, in, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51 and 60, uh, calls Israel a light to the nations. So they are to reflect God's brightness back to God in praise, but also out to the nations, out to other people in witness. But if you notice, in the Old Testament, God is often sad and angry. Why does God seem more sad and angry in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament? Is this a different God? Is, is the God of the Old Testament different from the God of the New Testament? No, it's the same God. God was brokenhearted, heartbroken in the Old Testament. God's great Old Testament heartache was that Israel never lived up to the light of her true identity and mission. God called Israel my son, and for God, seeing the nation of Israel get older but never grow up was like having a son who perhaps becomes a criminal or who, who in quotes, never amounts to anything. Israel, God's son, was greatly disappointing to God. He broke God's heart. Israel broke God's heart. Israel was supposed to have been a light in two ways. They were supposed to have been ethically and morally pure, a positive, and a positive reflection of God's glory to other nations. But instead, Israel turned to idolatry. Notice in verse 5, as we're going to turn to it in a moment, how God calls people who walk in moral darkness idolaters. Back in the Old Testament, Israel's main problem, what kept her stuck in darkness and out of God's glory, was idolatry. Remember the golden calf at Mount Sinai. Well, these golden calf engineers didn't quite get the work right. They didn't have any of you fine engineers out there to, to help them. They made another kind of golden calf. The Israelites danced